right, with an introduction like that, I should be really rich. What's the deal? I'm calling my agent. <laughs> it's Brent Weinstein. Um, <laughs> so hey guys, um, my name is Jeff Gomez. I'm the CEO of Starlight Runner Entertainment. Um, we're gonna be talking about something um, that uh, I'm a little biased, but it's really exciting. Um, and there is uh, an electricity around what it is that, uh, that we're dealing with tonight that, I don't know, um, as a New Yorker, I remember what it felt like to be <laughs> on the Bowery ar around 1976, 1977, <laughs> when uh, the punk rock movement um, gave rise to whole new forms of music and um, uh, uh, created um, um, uh, just a, a tidal wave of creativity. Um, uh, that's to me what uh, transmedia is right now. And um, uh, what I'm going to do is um, uh, kind of give you a, a, a super quickie crash course. So um, uh, some of you here don't know what this is, and you're going to learn real fast. Uh, uh, those of you who, um, who have a familiarity with these concepts, um, we'll talk a little dirt and use some uh, uh, up-to-date illustrations to tell you how fast and how far uh, this technique has come and what the uh, business models and business potential for us right here in this room can be um, in the coming years. Um, so we're going to start um, by, uh, by also letting you guys know that um, uh, you, you should feel that this is a kind of uh, a, a general uh, discussion. Um, we'll, we'll not be um, uh, narking out too many people, so you can feel free to Twitter and, and tweet away um, <laughs> this, this evening. That's me, uh, my, my uh, uh, Twitter uh, handle, uh, pretty simple. Remember the underscore, because the other Jeff Gomez, he really is pissed at me. <laughs> He's not happy. Um, um, and... Um, uh, uh, we'll have a, a talk with Brent uh, about an hour in um, and, and uh, see the uh, business from his perspective. And then we're going to do a lot of Q&A, so save up the good questions uh, for the last 15-20 uh, minutes of the presentation. Um, I'm going to start with um, uh, basically uh, covering the fact that um, um, uh, what I'm talking about will often apply to these huge uh, tentpole properties, and you'll be hearing a lot about Avatar and, and um, uh, Star Wars and things like that. Um, what I want you to do is exercise your imagination. These concepts apply across the board, whether you're involved in uh, storytelling on the independent level, um, on the uh, uh, nonfiction level, uh, news, uh, uh, just about everything, um, even social causes and, and um, endeavors such as that, there is an application for transmedia, just, so just kind of uh, keep your mind open to this sort of thing. Now, um, the, um, the thing I'd like you to think about first <laughs> dates back tens of thousands of years. Uh, when we were uh, a, a tribal society, even in our earliest incarnation as human beings. Um, uh, the, the thing that, that we yearned for, uh, because the world was such a dangerous place, were answers. Um, uh, it, was, it was just really scary. And um, uh, what's interesting to me is that the dudes who had the answers weren't necessarily the guys who were running down the mastodons um, and the saber-toothed tigers. Um, they were like the gay dude, <laughs> um, the outsider, the, uh, the, the dreamer, the guy who kind of munched on a few plants um, and developed uh, some, some insights. And you know, he would gather people around that fire at night and talk to them, and um, back then, what, uh, what amounted to story was big and sloppy and unstructured and went on for nights and nights and nights. And in fact, um, uh, what he was really doing was kind of giving people the answers. Why does the sun rise? Why is uh, 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 my child sick? Um, and, um, um, and because he managed to kind of be a little bit convincing, 
um, they, they believed him and, and took what he said as fact. Now, if he bored people, um, chances are someone's going to chuck him off a cliff. Um, so, um, uh, what he had to do was keep his eye on the faces of the people around him and watch them really carefully. And in fact, when the leader types um, uh, vocalized, he would uh, acknowledge that, that vocalization and perhaps even integrate it into the narrative. Um, so what was actually happening was a kind of communal uh, a story that, that kind of went on night after night um, through the years and uh, gradually became refined and turned into things like epic poems and the, eventually the structures of the narratives we understand uh, today. What's interesting is that it took all this time, all this time for us to develop the technology so that um, uh, I, as a storyteller, um, telling a story to millions of people globally, uh, can detect what it is that's in your face, what it is that, that you feel about what I am saying, um, and what uh, is, is what is going on today is a, a kind of communal narrative and, and stories are slowly changing and evolving um, uh, to the point where we are all once again going to be involved in this um, uh, ongoing series of narratives. So the shortest distance it says between two people is a story but what transmedia does is it brings us back round that fire. So who am I? Um, uh, I'm a native New Yorker. Uh, to me, the new school was that uh, joint for hippies in the uh, 1970s. <laughs> um, and, um, and it's so wonderful uh, being able to talk to you today as someone who um, uh, dreamed of somehow being involved in storytelling in this weird kind of cross-platform way. The way that those uh, uh, crazy Japanese people told stories with their anime and their manga and their movies and characters jumping uh, from one uh, media platform to the next. Um, uh, I developed um, uh, comic books and video games in the 90s. Turok Dinosaur Hunter. Does anybody remember Turok? Um, from the Nintendo 64, um, and uh, Magic the Gathering, I was involved in that world, and, um, and now uh, I have Starlight Runner, and we've become pretty good at this uh, 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 cross-platform uh, storytelling. Uh, what my company does is offer strategies for the planning and implementation of uh, transmedia ro rollouts on a global scale, um, we deal with uh, almost every division of these huge media conglomerates as well as uh, interfacing with their licensees and perhaps most importantly with the fans. We keep them honest. <laughs> um, so what is transmedia storytelling? It's, um, it's a technique, people. It's a kind of philosophy uh, for conveying messages, themes, or storylines to a mass audience through the artful, and I emphasize that, <laughs> and well-planned use of multiple media platforms. Um, it's a kind of uh, communication and brand extension that broadens the life cycle of creative content and opens up channels of dialogue. The results of, of this kind of implementation include an intense loyalty because essentially, people, what you're doing is you're placing a pair of ears around your story so that it is listening to what people have to say. And when you do that, there is nothing more valuable in the world. People want to be listened to, particularly this generation of people who are, uh, this, these young people are the most published people in history. Um, and they're the most self-expressed young people in history. Um, uh, people condemn young people for being self-centered and in, uh, in, in involved in kind of celebrity culture, they simply are used to being validated for their opinions and for their self-expression, even if it's just for five or ten people. Um, 
uh, what, uh, what we're failing to do is integrate that aspect of, of society uh, into the stories that we're telling, but that's changing. Um, with transmedia, you get long-term engagement. The, the, uh, the audience's desire to share the experience um, you're extending the, the lifespan of your intellectual property. You're going to hear me say intellectual property or franchise, or um, these are just a, a number of different words for your story. Um, and of course, transmedia is helping people make more money because instead of repeating the same content over and over again on all these different media platforms, which is boring, and, um, and people have a short attention span. Once they got it, they got it. There's so much more out there to enjoy and experience that people are no longer watching stuff over and over and over again on different gadgets. They want to go deeper into these story worlds, and you have to offer that to them. In the old days, um, if you went to a movie and enjoyed it, you might pick up the novelization. Um, uh, if, the, if you were involved with video games or, or enjoyed them, once in a while you might even have picked up the, uh, uh, the game of the movie, which almost entirely sucked. <laughs> the uh, result was kind of an okay experience. Mm, you know, it got worse and worse as things went along. Um, and, um, and what you did was spend a lot of money and not be entirely satisfied. How times have changed. Um, now, what is happening? I used to say, what's going to happen? But now it's what is happening. Um, <laughs> John and David, remember. Um, it is that um, uh, we are designing uh, narratives uh, in, in pieces in such a way that the audience does a little work and fits them together. And, and when uh, that, that book, which might be a prequel to the movie, or a sequel, and the video game, which could be a vast expansion of, of that world, um, or tell something new about the canon, like Force Unleashed or, or something like that, um, that was additive to the experience. And the act of snapping these things together and having them fit um, in an elegant kind of way, is actually kind of surprising and delightful to your audience. It creates a kind of bliss because they feel that they are cared for. They feel that you're doing a little bit of extra work to make this world, this fictional world, seem a little bit more like the world we understand, a world that has continuity, a world that, that does make sense in uh, the grand scheme, more or less. Um, so in essence, we are taking each individual media platform and treating it as an instrument, a beautiful instrument, to say the least. Um, and each one of those instruments independently is capable of generating a Sopranos or a Led Zeppelin IV. <laughs> Um, but now, when you're uh, um, uh, kind of designing this from the start, you can create uh, essentially a symphonic narrative that is leveraging to the strengths of each of these media platforms. Essentially, you are no longer taking your intellectual property, designating a platform, and developing for that platform solely, you are placing your intellectual property in the middle and extending out. This means that you have to do a little extra work to make sure that your property is going to uh, extend out OK. Um, uh, an example of uh, a kind of free form of transmedia is Star Wars. Say what you, what you will about individual pieces of Star Wars. As a whole, it is far more than its parts. Um, there is a, a coordinated rollout. It's cross-platform storytelling. And it is appealing to different segments of the audience, even different generations. Um, we're seeing this more and more. Uh, particularly with uh, kid properties uh, or, or video game properties. 
<clears throat> um, but what's really interesting and is only becoming more and more interesting are companies like uh, the Walt Disney Company. Uh, um, uh, Michael Eisner was a, uh, a greatest generation dude. Uh, Bob Iger, who took his place as the uh, CEO of the Walt Disney Company, he's a, uh, a baby boomer. He's a television kid. So he understood the value of multiple platforms and decided that the Disney Company wasn't just going to be about theatrical feature films. It wasn't going to drive itself. Its engine wasn't necessarily going to be that. He um, got into power and then slowly, over the course of the last five or six years, has affected um, a, a tremendous change. And there is still tumultuousness going on in, in the company. But look at what has emerged. Um, there are these properties that are leaping uh, nimbly uh, across different media platforms. There's stuff like High School Musical, which is old school in that it's sort of the same story over and over and over again, um, whether even if it's on ice. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> but then there are interesting uh, experiments like Lost um, or, or uh, uh, storylines that are extending themselves and are targeted uh, to, to young girls like uh, uh, fairies or Hannah Montana that are more interesting because the, the story world is getting more and more rich and, um, and allowing us to, to dig deeper and deeper. Um, uh, most recently, uh, Bob Iger hired the producer of Tron Legacy, uh, Sean Bailey, uh, to run the, the, the movie studio. Um, Sean Bailey came out of uh, uh, Project Greenlight and, and uh, the, the new media space, and here he is developing a narrative for Tron that extends uh, clearly across all these different media platforms and um, he is taking uh, that experience and the notion of transmedia and now that the old guard is essentially been decapitated at Disney, um, th this new uh, guard is, is taking root and, um, and uh, baking transmedia directly into everything that's going on at Disney. Um, some projects that I've been involved with, uh, just so you understand a little bit more about my background, include Avatar. Uh, working with uh, the producer and director of Avatar, James Cameron, um, to make that world more robust and to help 20th Century Fox extend that universe organically over uh, different media platforms. Um, they, uh, uh, they didn't do enough to my very biased taste, but they're going to count on it. Um, Pirates of the Caribbean for the Walt Disney Company, um, helping uh, that mythology to, to blossom and then be extended across all these different media platforms. Uh, Transformers for Hasbro, um, which is rolling out on the hub and is relaunching um, so that uh, the uh, franchise uh, will persist long after uh, uh, Michael Bay's incredible trilogy. <laughs> Uh, we've worked on Halo, uh, helping to increase the story um, uh, uh, caliber there, and, and Halo Reach is spectacular. Um, uh, Men in Black for Sony, Tron with Sean and, uh, and Disney again, uh, a touch on, uh, on fairies, and Hot Wheels. Um, if you've got kids and they're watching Cartoon Network, hopefully they've been enjoying uh, a series that uh, actually was uh, created by Starlight Runner, uh, in 2002. Um, this is uh, becoming an evergreen property, an entertainment world uh, around the cars uh, for Mattel. We've even worked with consumer product companies like Coca-Cola, uh, developing the universe of happiness factory and implementing it all over the world. Transmedia um, uh, is blossoming. Um, there is uh, all this coverage. Uh, everyone and his brother is uh, putting out a transmedia shingle. Most people don't even know what that means. Um, the buzzword is, is caught on, but um, the one thing you can be sure of is that the Producers Guild um, knows what it is. <laughs> um, the, 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 I joined the PGA a few years ago, uh, a few years back, babbling about this stuff, and 
like the oldest dude in the room <laughs> locked eyes with me and said, you're it. This is interesting. Let's give you a panel, a seminar. It's David Picker. Uh, not, not the kids. They ignored me. David, thank you so much for uh, uh, recognizing um, uh, a crazy person. <laughs> um, I started talking about it. Um, and, um, and received, to my shock, incredible support here at, uh, at PGA East. Um, and, um, and it wound up catching uh, a hold of the attention of the, the people out west. And within three years, uh, something amazing happened. The, the skill set and the, the, um, um, the, the validation required by someone who does this sort of thing was acknowledged by the Producers Guild this past April, and the Transmedia Producer Credit uh, was formed. <laughs> totally wild. It leaked on Nikki Fink, and I got in big trouble. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, and, and it's, it's funny, they, they told me, some people told me, well, if it goes on Nikki Fink, uh, uh, Variety is never going to run that story. And they did 24 hours later. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, all right. Um, what makes a, a great story? What makes a story that's going to be resonant with the world? Um, this is uh, the sort of question we need to ask because in transmedia, it's not so much about the technology. Granted, uh, that, that's really important. Um, but uh, um, what it's really about is making your story and the world of your story robust enough to withstand these extensions. Because remember those lame video games, the problem with them is that those guys uh, who made that game, they're not untalented, they knew exactly how to program a game. What they didn't understand was story, and what they didn't have access to were the people who were creating the stories for the, the, the feature films, some of which were pretty good. Um, and, um, and what we're advocating here is a kind of uh, a cooperative and, um, and a kind of acknowledgement that good storytellers are fairly rare and, um, and uh, good stories, storytellers need to acknowledge that, that the people building the extensions of these story worlds could use some help. Um, so um, the uh, criteria that I'm listing here are what we found over the past decade during our extensive research into anything and everything that captured the imagination of a mass audience. This is what they had in common. <clears throat> Generally, one story world, one narrative, and one audience. These worlds had scope, scale, and depth, and I'm going to elaborate on all of this momentarily. They had persistent, high-quality creative. Um, we were advocating not all of them had a coordinated multi-platform rollout or careful market segmentation, um, um, but uh, the licensing generally um, helped the property uh, to persist. These. Um, these narratives had deep, rich, fictional worlds that possessed a past, a present, and events that take place after whatever it is that you're enjoying. In short, the world existed outside of the borders of the screen that you were watching. They had uh, compelling storylines and story arc development. Um, say what you will about Pirates of the Caribbean, Jerry Bruckheimer insisted on a feeling of realism for the world. Uh, carefully researched um, props and ships and costuming and things like that. It all may not have been period perfect, but it felt absolutely authentic. And a convincing presentation that takes the world and the viewer seriously is something that these uh, huge blockbuster properties had in common. An internal logic and consistency. Even if your property is silly, even if, um, um, 
uh, there is fantasy or science fiction involved. It had to sort of make sense. It had to answer questions. It bugged the hell out of me that Peter Parker was shown to have spider sense for uh, uh, movies one and two, and then constantly got attacked from behind in movie three. <laughs> Didn't he? What's with that? Now, that sounds geeky. <laughs> and I admit, super geek. However, um, even for those of you who are not geeks, there is almost like a subconscious thought that, that a fact that presented itself as such for two whole movies was being ignored in this third movie. And that grates on people. It's what makes you go, oh, that was okay. Timeless themes that are simple but artfully presented. Cultivation, validation, and celebration of the fan base. Without them, you're not going to get very far. Extensions that maintain the quality and brand integrity of your story world. Interwoven storylines and continuity across platforms and product lines. What that means is that um, uh, if, if something takes place on one media platform, um, in, in the movie, and you read a book and it contradicts what, what the movie says or, or has nothing at all to do with what went on in the movie, um, young people are starting to um, uh, experience uh, cognitive dissonance. It, it doesn't make sense, you know? Um, and, um, and so we need things to, to make sense these days. They're hip little suckers. Um, <laughs> Careful market segmentation. Okay, if you're if you're uh, uh, if the audience for um, the main narrative is a little older, and you want to make stuff that appeals to younger kids set in the same world, it had better respect that that world and and uh, and that older audience. Um, if you start breaking all the rules just to to quack at little kids, um, you're you're going to uh, lose them both. Attention to quality, detail, and coordination. Um, I, I wish I can say this goes without saying. <laughs> um, details matter. Um, uh, it, it aggravates me when um, uh, animation companies and networks put on shows that have four characters hanging out by a pond and targeted at the same audience that understands the uh, and memorizes the names of all 1500 Pokemon characters. What is the deal? The, the kids are, are smart. They're picking things up uh, quickly. Um, you can afford to make your worlds rich and deep. And uh, finally, a creative visionary and IP stewards. I am not advocating through transmedia storytelling, uh, storytelling by committee necessarily. Again, I do believe that storytellers, really great ones, are relatively rare uh, and we need to respect them and extend uh, their visions as stewards and make sure to defend and protect that story world as it makes its journey across these different platforms. All right, so how do you do this? Well, let's talk about the difference between um, uh, the euphemism here is protected. Um, I, I call them locked. Um, uh, protected properties and, and open properties. Um, uh, there are, are, are a number of protected properties, some of which are, are kind of interesting. Um, you can understand uh, that J.K. Rowling would want to uh, make certain that anything based on Harry Potter is derivative of those novels. And, um, and so what we get um, is good storytelling and, and good quality uh, products, but they will always stand between the beginning of the first book and the end of the final book. That's it. So ultimately, there is an expiration date on Harry Potter. Um, uh, we can only tell so many stories, and unless J.K. wants to do something uh, more, um, that's it. Um, Twilight. Well, you know, we feel that uh, Twilight has incredible power and can keep on going. 
Uh, but again, uh, Stephanie Meyer uh, has echoed, um, with, with good reason to uh, a certain degree, uh, J.K.'s uh, uh, element. But Stephanie, it's not Shakespeare. <laughs> Come on. How many great properties for, for girls, and I guess that's debatable, but uh, how many are there? Um, open it up. Let's, let's have fun in the Twilight universe. We can even attract guys. Um, uh, one day, maybe. Um, uh, what's interesting to me is, is uh, in the case of the current status of both the Marvel and Star Trek universes, they're shut down. Uh, we can't play in, in those universes. Um, they're, they're, if you go to the movies and watch Wolverine or, or uh, Spider-Man and want to be in that world and read about that specific world, if you pick up the comics, you're going to be completely lost. If you watch uh, the stuff on television, again, those characters are looking and behaving in completely different ways from the ones that we've seen in the movies. There's no place to go. Girls liked Star Trek for one brief shining moment last year. Wow! <laughs> but when they went to, to look up uh, Spock on the internet, they either saw that old dude <laughs> or they saw Siler from, from Heroes. Um, they did not see more adventures of Spock. They, they could not access this, uh, this character. Uh, and that's because uh, the political situation in Viacom is preventing uh, uh, the proliferation of uh, Star Trek content, even though J.J. Abrams, one of the great uh, transmedia storytellers, is involved. Ah, uh, open properties. I am relieved. Um, uh, Avatar is, is going to be uh, open um, uh, cautiously because uh, Jim is going to, to uh, watch very carefully how uh, the content gets extended, um, but it is going to be open. Star Wars, of course, we know it, uh, many, many talented people are involved in telling uh, uh, more stories in that universe. Tron uh, started, the Tron Legacy uh, implementation is completely uh, open, meaning uh, lots of people can be additive to uh, the mythology. The video game guys added a, an entire like century of continuity to the Tron uh, uh, chronology and uh, the Disney consumer products people saw some of the designs that they did for for those vehicles and added them to the product line that is um, better than synergy that's transmedia storytelling um, even something like Valmont University where uh, you could sign up and and uh, be matriculated into this fictional university so that you can help this poor girl find her brother who's been kidnapped by vampires um, uh, is, is something where uh, you can have a lot of fun and even be additive to the narrative. Uh, so in short, um, we're now starting to think on a non-linear basis. Um, it is not just um, uh, telling a story chronologically, uh, even across multiple media platforms, um, the, the story can move in, in all kinds of different directions. When we dive deep into uh, the core of a property, we can find the tools as producers that we need to expand the storyline on and on. <clears throat> We talked uh, at the beginning about those questions that we have uh, about life. And I want to introduce to you the concept of the grand narrative. Um, the grand narrative is something um, uh, that runs through uh, our lives and runs through history. It is the exploration of what it means to be human. It is um, uh, the pursuit of the meaning of the human soul. Um, when, when we think about doing uh, transmedia storytelling well, we need to think about adhering to those big questions, those great questions. And while the audience has the luxury of not having to know any of that, or not even necessarily caring, we must. Um, the universe is not just about uh, uh, fine characters or beautiful settings. It is a reflection of you as the artist, um, and it has to stand up to scrutiny. 
Um, it has to stand up to analysis. Um, so it needs to be rich, it needs to be sophisticated. Um, so we are advocating uh, when you are thinking about conducting a transmedia implementation to build yourself a tool set, um, documents that guide not just you, but the teams of people who will be involved in implementing this. Even if that team is uh, your, your kid brother and your next door neighbor, because this is an indie thing, um, still, they all need to be um, uh, experiencing uh, relatively the same basic vision, um, this uh, mythology that you're going to unfold across these different uh, media platforms. So uh, we're talking about, uh, first, if, if you're not the creator, we're going to need to engage the creator. Because if you don't have the cooperation of the visionary behind um, uh, this uh, story world, uh, then your, your stuff's not going to be that good because you're only guessing. Um, and that's what we are getting with a lot of these kind of digital implementations that are uh, marketing extensions of big tentpole franchises or even TV shows. Um, so we need to um, engage the visionary. So um, if, if you met with the visionary, um, and, and demonstrated a willingness to immerse yourself into uh, the property, into the universe, uh, and, and extend what the visionary believes it to be, um, uh, and work to create uh, exciting stories that meet the high standards of the franchise, you can form a bond of trust uh, that makes it possible to generate um, these kinds of accomplishments uh, um, across all these different channels. This is the key uh, to, to my success as a transmedia producer. I can get in a room uh, with someone like uh, um, a James Cameron or a Bungie and, and, say, and say the things that make them understand that I get it and, and that I'm not here to impose my vision of your world on these extensions. I am here to take yours, the DNA, uh, the essence of what you have to say and, and take it out uh, across these platforms. Um, the first thing you have to derive then is the message. It's often the most difficult thing because a lot of uh, visionaries, they're not going to spell it out for you. It's funny, as huge as some of these worlds can be, the best ones hold um, uh, a single core uh, important uh, message. Everything else is theme and variation on that message and it's embodied in the hero and woven through every aspect of the franchise. Uh, there are thousands of stories set in the Star Wars universe that don't feature Luke or Anakin Skywalker, um, but Lucasfilm um, does not want to generate uh, tons of content where two dudes in robes uh, hit each other with light sticks. Um, tempting as that is. Um, uh, the reason is that that is not the meaning of Star Wars. Um, uh, the, uh, the true meaning needs to be infused in order for the product to be any good. Um, from that meaning and from the, the definition of the property in its entirety, um, we need to develop a kind of franchise logline, not, not a TV episode logline or even a movie logline. You're going to sum up the whole thing. Um, and it's going to describe the franchise on the, on the broadest scale. We also need to come up with the brand archetype. Um, uh, now, with extraordinary brands, that's easy um, uh, because they're larger than life. Uh, they can even be the, the symbol of uh, entire cultures. Um, but uh, understanding, understanding and leveraging the archetypes, the things that uh, resonate for you out of uh, th this story world that you're dealing with is really, really important. Um, it's the soul of your brand, your story world, your franchise. Um, and um, and uh, the, the talent that's involved, that is what expresses uh, this, this archetype in ways that tap into our, our universal uh, feelings and instincts. 
So here are, are some of the great uh, brand archetypes. And you can look uh, this, this up and, and learn more about it. We have to go through it fast. So there's the, uh, uh, the trickster. There is uh, the caregiver, the hero, the rebel, the innocent. All of these things spring uh, quickly to mind. The sage, the lover, the magician, the ruler. I mean, Lucas just kind of like collected them all and stuck them into one movie. <laughs> um, truly compelling stories come not out of a blanket mission statement, but rather from the depiction of the complex, conflicted individual personal decisions that must be made at individual times and individual places. The ultimate theme of any franchise is innately positive. Anything that, that's truly transcended is one that is uh, reflected across the, the breadth and can, uh, of the canon and all applications. So here's what I'm really saying, guys. <clears throat> um, if what is in the heart of the story that you have to tell is essentially and fundamentally negative, if it is nihilist, if it is life sucks, you are not going to get something that's going to be scalable to the point that transmedia is going to be successful. That's not to say, I'm not standing here condemning uh, 70s existentialism. <laughs> Um, I love uh, uh, Sidney Lumet as much as uh, anybody. <laughs> but, um, uh, but we're talking about um, a generally properties that need to persist, that, that, that warrant the kind of investment uh, that, that it takes to uh, maintain transmedia over the, the course of some period of time, um, that, that there has to be something aspirational, something that is life-affirming at the heart of the property. Um, uh, so uh, a property that could have come across as uh, hyper competitive and all about smashing up your race car, sort of what it was, um, as an entertainment franchise is you become stronger when you align yourself with others. Boy, that was a triple somersault to get past uh, Mattel. Um, <laughs> but it worked. Uh, to their credit. Um, uh, uh, Johnny Depp uh, uh, conveyed to Starlight Runner uh, in, in one sentence um, uh, the essence of Pirates of the Caribbean, which was a really tough nut for us to crack. And he said, well, I, I wondered what it would be like to walk that tightrope between nobility and savagery. <laughs> and uh, boom, um, uh, you, he, he achieved a state of grace as far as I was concerned. Um, and that's uh, the essence of Pirates of the Caribbean. Even on the cosmic level, regimented civilization comes sweeping across the Atlantic, encountering the wild, untamed savagery of the Caribbean, and it unleashes the supernatural and it unleashes all kinds of, of war and conflict. And here's this dude kind of wandering like a pinball <laughs> between the two. Spectacular. Thumbing his nose all the way. Aspirational drivers. This is the real secret sauce, people. The greatest franchises in history of pop culture are the ones whose themes connect with the heart and whose main character ennobles and enables those themes. These themes and our characters' ability to act on them are reflective of our wishes and fears, what is just beyond our reach and what we hope we can become. These are aspirational drivers. They are elements that you must recognize in your story world in order to make them really, really work. Here are a few that, um, uh, that, that we encountered in just weird everyday stuff. Um, um, the, the warrior in, uh, in Nike, <laughs> the ruler, <laughs> hey, <laughs> it was successful, <laughs> the explorer, 
these are just elements that, that give you a taste of what these are. We can talk more uh, later. Uh, when a franchise fills an aspirational niche in the public mind that's been missing for a while, wow, watch out, watch out. Something interesting, for example, what is the deal with Twilight? I keep harping on it. Um, what's wild is that for the first time, perhaps in pop culture history, the nurturer, which is a motherly archetype, is infused into a dude whose gl skin glitters like diamonds. <laughs> um, so you get the best of both worlds. Wow. <laughs> um, someone who will watch me all night and listen to me <laughs> also looks hot. <laughs> Gold. Gold, people. Um, security. We all need it. Uh, overcoming fear. These are uh, aspirational drivers. Um, and finally, uh, just with regard to the criteria for uh, a great um, uh, transmedia franchise, are the distant mountains. Tolkien coined this term. Uh, when you read about Gandalf or, or even saw the, the, the movies and he's leading this fellowship across these lands, occasionally he'd point out some mountain somewhere and go, oh, that's Galthanor of Tinthelfun and uh, my brother-in-law Murray had a, you know, a party on that mountain and it was just totally wild. And, and the, the others were like, oh, really? And, and he, whatever he said was intriguing enough <laughs> for us to <laughs> for us to want to go there we wish we can hang out on that mountain and you know what there's actually a town of like women with beards on the other side and and uh, and I want to see that too but we're not going to go there we're not going to go there we're going to continue this is transmedia um we're, we're going to go to Mordor um so the one, one time that Tolkien created a distant mountain, he had Bilbo find this funny little ring in a cave halfway through The Hobbit. And, um, and he puts it on, and we basically forget about it until a couple of years later, after the book is a hit, he goes, what am I going to do for a sequel? Oh, there's, there's that ring that's going to make Peter Jackson a billion dollars. <laughs> distant mountains. Planting... Uh, specific seeds that hatch uh, spectacular uh, r results. Um, so uh, these are um, the other examples include the, the greatest lines uh, in all of George Lucas's life. You fought in the Clone Wars? Yes, I was a Jedi Knight, same as your father. He could have said y you fought in the Civil War or you fought in the battle. Um, no, he said Clone Wars and had people of my generation uh, thinking about what the hell that was for, for 20 years or so. And then Lucas makes a billion dollars. Um, <laughs> the heathen gods of the sea became a line of Disney consumer product toys. Dorothy's uh, uh, ruby sis slippers became a Broadway play. Uh, the bumps on the Klingons. Some things don't get ever get resolved. The four-toed statue and lost. What the hell was it? <laughs> we'll never know. <clears throat> Okay, um, uh, in this last leg before we get to Brent, uh, we're going to talk about uh, participation. It's so important for transmedia, we cannot forget it. Um, uh, here's that, that glorious staircase um, that we uh, teach all of our clients about. The fact that if you satisfy the engagement initially, if someone likes your story, they're going to come back for more. In fact, they may tell their friends about it, and if you kind of nudge them along in certain ways, if there's true quality, um, or if you show that you're listening to them, wow, they become specialists. Remember, we're still dealing with a population that's pretty spread out. People in, in, uh, in, in different places, different schools, different towns, everyone wants to be a specialist at something. And if you're showing a TV show or a movie or, or a novel or something like that, there's at least going to be some goomer who's going to want to be the best in the world at your thing. Um, they become the ambassador. They become the evangelist. Check this out. Um, and 
if you work it well enough, they light that torch in the dark and say, I, I, this is mine. I, I have this property and I'm going to, to usher you in. Be careful with those torch bearers because if you piss them off, they can turn around and burn your house down. Um, so it's, it's a, a double-edged sword. Um, but um, how do you develop that? You get them to participate because that is the mentality, that is how young people are wired today. Um, uh, allowing them to post uh, uh, on the internet about content uh, or blog and, and so forth. Uh, allowing them to forward and share content, uh, to rate it, um, to comment on it, even if those comments are nasty. Uh, so many of our clients are afraid of owning the fandom because fans say things that hurt their feelings. <clears throat> um, Come on, guys. Um, if, if they're swearing about you and taking the time to say your stuff is crap, it's, chances are they're going to stick around to watch the next episode and, and, and so forth. Um, so um, let them, please. Um, uh, get them to socialize with one another um, uh, and, um, and then uh, engage with uh, uh, canonical interactive content. Those webisodes and so forth need to have a component that allows for instant feedback. Um, the internet is not television. <laughs> you need to have some kind of uh, engagement element uh, if you're going to post video there. Um, they can uh, do the mashups, the editing of content. Um, and uh, ultimately, they can even submit original content, those fan films that we've heard so much about, uh, original songs and, and things like that. And um, uh, eventually, and this hasn't quite happened on any kind of grand scale yet, but the generation of authorized canonical content. One day soon, we're working on this, people, and we're, we're working with attorneys and everything to make this work. Um, young people will be able to tell stories that eventually get accepted into the canon. They become the official in-game part of the mythology of the universe of your property. And they will be validated because they'll be compensated in some way. It's not fan slavery. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a business. Um, so we'll, um, uh, we'll figure out how to um, uh, validate uh, these contributions and who knows, um, our, our great uh, transmedia symphony composer may emerge from all that. Um, okay, we're going to head into the business uh, aspect of what it is that we're doing. I'm going to call Brent in just a minute. How do you, um, as someone who is captivated by this idea, someone who perhaps has produced content for one media platform or another, how do you um, uh, start to build a, a story world or become a part of the construction of a story world that is going to um, engage people at a, perhaps a grassroots level, but ultimately make money because you got to eat. Um, you need to establish Authorship. That's my first opinion. It's not the only uh, opinion. We're going to hear from Brent about the rest. Um, uh, so what, what we need to do is um, uh, to, uh, by establishing authorship, I mean uh, setting a precedent, um, uh, creating evidence for the fact that uh, there is value in what it is that you're putting together. Uh, a screenplay alone is uh, very, very helpful, um, but it doesn't necessarily make a, um, a, a case for transmedia. Uh, what does is the appearance of the intellectual property on a few different media platforms at a, a contained uh, kind of grassroots level. So you need to establish your tools internally, your, your mythology, what is the story of this world, and, and get a, getting everybody on the same page. Uh, for it, and um, uh, pitch documents. You need to have good imagery. Um, everything needs to look professional. I can't tell you how many times we get submissions uh, with, with content that's crudely drawn um, and, um, and poorly uh, uh, typed, and, and the, the world documents are just a mess. Nothing makes sense. 
you really have to uh, iron all that stuff out. Uh, there are sizzle reels, um, uh, um, uh, three-minute uh, series of images and, um, and uh, information that's conveyed to the viewer that sets the stage for the story worlds. Um, understanding the various platforms and how um, uh, the content uh, can be leveraged across these uh, uh, platforms, perhaps even developing uh, something simple for them. Uh, an, an iPhone app uh, could cost only a few thousand dollars, maybe a little more, uh, and still be uh, fairly successful. Um, and there's nothing like the written word, uh, people. Hollywood emerged out of New York City. Um, uh, the, the publishing community uh, uh, specifically, uh, and there are still this kind of strange tie between them. Nobody west of the Mississippi reads, but boy, if there's a book, um, especially if there's pictures, <laughs> they snap to it. Um, and, and what's interesting about uh, novels or, or, or comics is, first of all, you can publish them independently. You don't necessarily need a random house, though it helps, uh, or a Marvel. Uh, don't go there. They own it all. Disney. Um, but um, uh, you, you can put this stuff together relatively inexpensively. And, um, and if it's a, a quality artwork, it raises the perceived value. There's a price tag on your intellectual property. Whether it's sold 250 copies or 100,000 copies doesn't matter. They're holding it in their hands. It's real, and that makes everything inside of it real, and that makes your story world real. Um, also, of course, things like comics uh, are almost like um, instant storyboards. They, um, uh, they convey uh, the narrative in a, a powerful way, and you can use... Um, the, the content, even, even the pages that aren't the, um, the, the comic strip itself, uh, to convey the fact that this story world is rich and, um, and capable of being uh, extended uh, across different media platforms.